and to tell the stories. Um, it's a good question. I think what we're seeing in the wine industry now is it's almost like a polarisation. So we've got, on the one hand, you've got commercial wine um, or commodity wine that's being made in large quantities, um, often in a way that's quite um, industrial process. Um, and often these wines just, they do a job and they're important. I guess everybody needs to have cheap wine, but they don't communicate um, a sense of place in the way that wine can do. And it's one of the most interesting things about wine is when you get wines that manage to capture a locality or a sense of place and produce something that can only be made in that region, have this local flavour. And so on one hand we've got quite you know, the, the industrialisation of wine, on the other hand you've got um, a really quite a growing movement of people who are making really interesting authentic wines. And I think that's happening across the world in lots of different regions. Whenever you go to a wine region, you'll find, yes, the, maybe the big producers, but then you'll find some usually smaller producers who are, are really doing really interesting things. And often, there are far more of them than there were 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. So it does seem to be growing. There seems to be more interesting wine being made around the world than there ever was. But at the same time, there's probably more boring, un uninteresting wine being made around the world at the same time. I think that there's a lot of wine that's being made that's quite ambitious, it's aiming at the high end, where people are just getting it wrong. They're trying to replicate Bordeaux, for instance, in a warm Mediterranean climate, or they're planting Cabernet and Merlot and terroirs that probably would be actually better for, for Mediterranean varieties or, or even indigenous varieties. And it's a, such a shame when you see people spending lots of money on a winery and spending lots of money in vineyards and making very expensive wine in very heavy bottles when the actual wine is not very interesting and it doesn't character, capture the, the sense of place at all. It's just like a, a, almost like a childish expression of wine. I think the internet's changed everything when it comes to wine communication because it means that suddenly what used to be a, a vertical conversation where the expert would speak down to the, the, the reader or consumer. And suddenly now it's more like a conversation and everyone gets to play in this conversation about wine. So you've got, um, you can have, um, if you're a wine producer, you can speak directly with journalists, you can speak directly with um, consumers, you can speak directly with um, with other wineries. Um, you, you know, all these, suddenly there's this whole um, openness of communication that previously you didn't have through things like Twitter and Facebook especially um, and it's about getting in there um, being authentic um, listening um, joining in conversations and taking a different approach not this sort of like a, an outright sort of obvious marketing approach where you're trying to sell 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 but just joining in conversations and trying to understand what the people who, who are drinking your wine who happen to be discussing with you about your wine on Facebook want to say and that's a very interesting dynamic that I think that previously that, that wasn't there and it's there now so it's, it's open for everyone to use it if they want to. I've, I've tasted lots of wines that I really love and, and I've tasted lots of wines that have been a bit depressing as well <laughs> so it's a mixture. The depressing ones, and I don't want to name names because I think that's, uh, that's not necessary. And even the good ones, I think there's, there's one wine I try to say that's absolutely amazing ones. Um, but I think the, the, the depressing ones are the ones who are trying to, haven't got the confidence to be Bulgarian or whatever country they come from, and, and are just trying to ape Bordeaux. Um, and that's the, so there's so many. And, and so many people seem to be obsessed with sweetness and ripeness and picking too late. And there's no joy in, in drinking this sweetly fruited, um, syrupy, dead fruits, 15.5% Merlot. There's no joy in that. It's, it's quite depressing. And there's quite a lot of wines that have been made by people who simply are picking too late. And that's, that's not necessary. And I guess it's, it's I think what it 
maybe maybe it's uh, the trend for wines that are a bit fresher and more um, well defined and more vibrant hasn't kind of got here yet. I don't know. Maybe the cons consumers here love those really big wines that taste like late or vintage port. Maybe they like those. But I just think that's a that's sort of sustainable future for for Bulgarian or Bulgarian. Sold well in different countries, because yeah. and, and also local local wines. Um, there's a, a variety I tried today that um, had, um, that was just brilliant. It's with G. I can't remember what it's. Um, it's just, I shouldn't do this on camera, should I? Not know the variety, but I tasted it. I thought this tastes just like Kadarka, which is a Hungarian variety. Yeah. And okay. it turns out it's, it's the same variety as Kadarka. Yes. And it makes lighter style wines. Yes. Um, with with um, you know lighter slightly lighter colour red wines but with freshness and definition yes. and, uh, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, you know, and that's that's the sort of variety that people should be planting. You know. I think you have to think about different segments of the marketplace. I think the um, at the high end, at the commercial end, I think it's difficult to say because but at the high end, I think that there's there's definitely still a move towards um, that, that's, I think I hope it will speed up and catch on and to make you more interesting wines that are that have better definition, um, that aren't too alcoholic. Um, you know, working hard in the vineyards, getting vineyards right and understanding vineyards, working, um, you know, getting your vineyard soil health right, and, and then through that being able to pick at a sensible time and make wines that aren't too alcoholic and too big. Which have got real interest, and I think that trend is continuing. I think wherever I go, I see people, you know, doing that. Trying, they're not. People are trying to make bigger and more alcoholic and bolder wines in most places. They're trying to make fresher, better defined, more elegant wines. I think the best part is travelling and meeting new people and um, going to new places and. Kind of discovering things. It's, it's, there's lots of fascination, I think, and it makes me feel um, excited again uh, when I go somewhere new and try new things and meet new people. Because it's a nice industry. It tends to attract people who are quite nice, and that's that's a good thing. My favourite stories is when I go somewhere and I meet a wine grower who's not well known. But he's making really great wines, and then I go and tell the story, and suddenly all the UK importers kind of email me saying, "Can you give me contact details of this person?" <laughs> yes, and when you've managed to find somebody an importer into the UK, it's happened a few times in the last year, and I think that's the most exciting thing because it's like you're actually doing something useful. You're, you're helping the good guys win, and I think that's a wine journalist. That's what I love to do is help the good guys win, not yeah. the people with the biggest marketing budgets, and, you know, yes. but, the, but the good guys. Greatly, um, I tend to like um, um, my comfort wine is probably Northern Road Reds, um, so like Cool Climate Syrah. Um, I think that I'm often, I'm often in the mood for that, um, but um, I buy all sorts of different things. I, I'm just driven by curiosity, so I, I think um, that, that's what that's what drives me. I just think the most important thing is to be positive and I think that um, it's just really good to, to ignore the negative stuff that occasionally crops up and it's, and it's good to, uh, one rule I have now is I don't write about writing about wine. Okay. So a lot of journalists uh, get drawn into struggles and tussles with other journalists and they start fighting or they, they, they criticise someone else's writing or their opinions and it's like that's the most negative thing. So my rule is don't write about writing about wine. We're not the story, we're here to tell the stories. So go and find the interesting stories, tell people about them, be enthusiastic about the stuff that deserves enthusiasm. And maybe there's some bad things out there, just it's probably best to just ignore the bad things. It's not nice to write about bad things.